What's up, party people? Mike here. Today we got another CD ripping stream for you. Today is September 3rd. We're here to finish what we started yesterday with Big T. Let's see how many CDs we got today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm not sure how many CDs are in the Phil Collins little box set there. But we have at least 10 CDs to rip today. Why don't we get started? First album here is the Moody Blues for children's children's children. I've never listened to this album, but I do like other Moody Blues albums. I'm hoping there's a lot of Mellotron on it because I love their use of the Mellotron. Let's get it open. does have a sticker on the top, which I do not like. I'll show you here. It does have a sticker. I'm just going to use my knife to cut through. Sometimes I'll just try to force it and try to break the sticker off, but on rare occasions that breaks the jewel case. That's why I prefer jewel cases over digipacks. Digipacks are those little cheapo cardboard pieces of junk. What's even worse than the digipacks are the really cheap cardboard sleeves. Those are just awful. Just a waste of money. the album art here in the reverse. I believe this is a 2008 reissue of an album that came out in 1970. Oh boy, we got to reflect the glare there. For our children's children's children. You know, I don't know how to make the webcam even focus. I don't even know. But we got, what, 13 tracks, then some bonus tracks in the bottom there. Like it has a nice booklet. I don't know if there's lyrics in it or not. I don't believe I've heard any of the songs off this album before. Got some nice pictures in here. Some nice writing. Credits for the photography. Does have lyrics. It's pretty, I love it when albums include the lyrics of them. You gotta know what they're singing, dude. And we got DB Power Amp pulled up. Just need to correct the tags and then we'll get it ripping. I 
like I said yesterday, I always reference multiple sources when I am doing the tagging on these albums. I usually accept what's on the back of the jewel case for the album itself as what it should be tagged as. But you do get, every once in a while, some inconsistencies or misspellings, and you have to go online to find what the real track name is, which is pretty annoying. to be a million. how this one's going to compare to the other 60s albums that I've listened to. Obviously, I have D Days of Future Past, which is like a fusion between progressive rock, rock, and classical music. And then you have, what, On a Threshold of a Dream? I think the Threshold label is Moody Blues' own label. I think it's named after Threshold. I also have a question of balance. I have that album. The only other 60s one I don't have, well, two of them, I don't have In Search of the Lost Chord. There's a box set for that album that I wanted to get, but it's a little pricey, and I probably shouldn't get it right now. And I think it's out of stock on Amazon anyway right now but and I also don't have the first album the Magnificent Moody's I I assume the Magnificent Moody's is more like a straightforward 60s rock kind of album Yeah, the Moody Blues aren't my favorite progressive rock band, but they're pretty good. They have their moments. 
they have kind of a good balance between like a psychedelic rock kind of vibe to like a kind of progressive rock vibe but they're not like I would say they're more like Pink Floyd proggy kind of instead of like a yes kind of prog so we got one CD down And today I will show you my tagging process for the album art as well. I'll show you what I do after I rip them. Alright, next album we got is... Decadent by Udo Dirkschneider. most well known for being the singer of uh, Accept. He played, God, what guitar hero was it that had balls to the wall? He sang on that song originally. Yeah, it's kind of like a, kind of a Bon Scott, kind of ACDC kind of sounding voice, but it's very raspy. And it's, it's not for everybody. It takes some getting used to when you're listening to him. But his music is like, straight up traditional heavy metal like I think Judas Priest but more of a kind of a modern sound to it one thing I think is funny when I'm listening to Udo is at least on the Rev Raptor album which I like the album art for that album it's kind of cheesy but a lot of his album art is pretty cheesy and weird but one thing I like about the Rev Raptor album that it isn't necessarily a good thing, I suppose, but the digital distortion that they use on the guitars is just like really cheesy sounding, but it gives it kind of a distinct vibe. Like it makes it sound weirdly modern. It gives it like a modern vibe to it. I don't know how to describe it. But this is another album I've never listened to. I think it was released in 2015. I think Udo had just has a crap ton of albums. And I have quite a few of them myself, but I'm pretty sure I'm just barely scraping the surface of what he has. Tags look good on this, I might not have to input very much info. By the way, I am, uh, get this rip going. In the background here, I'm playing music from my EP called R.I.P. You can find it at mikehannamedia.bandcamp.com and you can get it as a free download. Feel free to download it for free, do whatever you want with it, put it on your own videos, jam out to it, play it in public, I don't care. But I'd also appreciate it if you bought it too, but it's also free. I'm just going to let the EP play out at this point. I still haven't figured out the, uh, the particulars of what kind of music I can play on these streams or videos. And because I know there's certain services where you can subscribe to them and you can get royalty free music, but I have my own music, I guess, but I don't necessarily want my own music just like constantly looping in the background, like the whole video necessarily. So I figured I'd just let my music play out, play the EP while I'm chilling here. The 
bass guitarist name is Fiddy Weinhold. Fiddy. <laughs> He's also the co-producer. On drums, Francesco Yovino. I know, uh... What is it? The drummer for Accept became the guitarist for Udo's band. And I think this is after, this album came after that guitar stopped playing because I think he had some health issues. I don't recognize any of the names of the guitarists. Kasperi Heikinen or Andrei Smirnov. But I mean, I'm expecting this album to sound, you know, just like all the other Udo albums. It's like straightforward. Judas Priest kind of metal. Like, it's just heavy metal. Okay, we got that one done. I didn't show the album art for this one. I'll have to show you. It's a very cheesy piece of album art. Look at that. <laughs> Decadent. <laughs> Just a big old fat cigar. Udo. Very cheesy. A lot of his album art is pretty cheesy. This one does not disappoint. Alright, what do we got next? We have MSG by the McAuley Shanker Group. I actually already have a copy of this album, but I saw this one at Co-op Records here in Moline, Illinois, and I had to have it because it's a remaster. And here's the album art. Just a nice, simple design. And I believe it's reissued by Hear No Evil Recordings or Hear No Evil Records which I believe is a subsidiary of Cherry Red Records. And Cherry Red does a lot of great reissues. Sometimes their remasterings are a little loud, but they generally do a really good job of finding out of print recordings and getting them back in print. I'll give you the back cover of this. Got Michael Shanker there on the left and Robin McCauley on the right. This doesn't have any bonus tracks, it just has the original album. I kind of like the logo that they have on the CD. You can see that. Hear No Evil recording. Not to get ahead of myself, but we have two box sets today. Two special box sets. One of them is actually by Cherry Red Records. Or subsidiary of Cherry Red Records. We'll get to that. I believe James Kodak who's known for also playing for Scorpions, plays on this album. It doesn't have the credits on here. It's mastered by Andy Pierce, who he's done some good work before. Probably the most notable to me would be the Black Sabbath 2012 remasters. And also, I believe he did the... Uriah Heep remasters that came out a few years back. And those were really good, except the bonus tracks sounded like dirt. And I don't know if he did those or not, but the original albums sounded really good. And what I think I will do afterwards, after I'm done tagging everything, is I'll do a quick comparison between some of the masterings of some of the stuff I ripped yesterday 
And at least, I, I will at least do this album to see if it looks any different than the original release that came out in... I believe this album came out in 92. Make sure the track listing is correct. Two albums so far, The Moody Blues and Udo. Like I've said before, I I really appreciate the people that do the scans on Discogs. Discogs is such a useful resource for doing tagging or cataloging your own um, collection. I really appreciate the people that take the time to do these scans and put them up on the site. Also, where I get my album art, I really appreciate those people as well. And it's kind of a weird thing because I can't really... It's not a situation where I want to donate to these people for the work that they're doing, because in a way it's like they're uploading these copyrighted works, but what they're, the work they're doing is good, so it's kind of a, an awkward situation. I don't know how to, I don't know how to really express it, but. first box set. And this is a band I've been meaning to listen to for a long time. But I, they may have been on streaming services, but I, I don't recall. It's a band called Pilot. It has four albums in it. First album is called From the Album of the Same Name. And we got Second Flight. And we have Warren Heights. And then To the Crowd. Now, you've probably heard this band before. Their biggest song is called Magic. And if you look that song up, I'm sure you've heard it before. Like, oh, it's magic. <laughs> I don't even I don't remember the lyrics. <laughs> But it goes like that, kind of. And the reason I've been meaning to listen to them for a long time is that they are very closely related to the Alan Parsons Project. And if you know me, I love the Alan Parsons Project. I believe... Um, hmm. Obviously, their singer... I think he plays bass as well. His name is David Patton. At least he played bass in the Alan Parsons Project, and he also did vocals. So you got David Patton, and then... I can't remember... Ian Berenson. I believe he was a drummer or a guitarist. Yeah, he was a guitarist for the Alan Parsons Project and Pilot. And then Stuart Tosh, I believe, was the drummer. Yeah. 
He played drums on a lot of Alan Parsons Project stuff and also played with Pilot. So you have kind of the core of a lot of the Alan Parsons Project bands in Pilot. So I'm curious how their music is. Ooh. The rear of the case is kind of dented in. Not really surprised these days with you know how packages get treated by either UPS or the Postal Service. But I think it'll pop out how it's supposed to look. These clamshells are always really cheap, but you know, this wasn't a real expensive set to begin with. So I'm not expecting like a pristine, like high quality package. Looks like it'll be fine. Yeah, this just came out. And... <laughs> the label that's a subsidiary of Cherry Red Records is called 7Ts. Like, 7, the number, and then T, apostrophe S. 7Ts records a division of cherry red records let's get ripping looks like it does include a booklet a lot of these clamshell boxes usually do not include a booklet looks like it has a nice uh written piece with pictures of the cassette tapes the original cassette tapes pictures of the band pictures of the singles um pictures of the labels of the singles. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Mastered by James Bragg. Cool. The first CD is from the album of the same name. Those must be the three band members. <laughs> I assume one of them's David Patton. There's another songwriter in the band. I can't remember what his name is. I think it's Bill Lyall. Yeah. Okay, let's get ripping this one. Oh, huh, that's kind of an interesting logo that's on there. You probably can't see it too well, but it's like kind of pixelated almost. Looks like Magic's on the first album here. No metadata found. That's never a good sign. That means I might have to type all this in manually. Looks like I was able to uh, use their metadata tool to pull data from Discogs for the original album, so I don't have to type everything in, but I'll still have to type a little bit in. Uh, would I classify this as prog rock or pop rock? This is probably pop rock, right? I usually don't care too much about what the genre is, but... Yeah, I'll classify it as pop rock. And then the question is, should I tag it as individual albums or should I tag it as a box set? I think I'm going to tag it as the box set. So, 2020, disc one of four. Let's 
see. Just a smile, magic. Go next door, love you. You never give up to the sky. Just let me be. And it looks like there's two tracks by a different group name, which I think is just they decided to do a single as a different name called Scotch Mist. I wonder why they decided to do that. Get that one going. Scotch Mist. Yeah, they just had the one single. Produced by Alan Parsons, of course. I wonder how many of these albums in the box that were produced by Alan Parsons. Probably the first two would be my guess. Yep. First one's produced by Alan Parsons. Second one's produced by Alan Parsons. Third one's produced by Roy Thomas Baker. He's done a ton of albums. Probably most well known for doing Queen. Then Alan Parsons might have done the fourth album as well. Yep. Interesting. Abbey Road. So I'm looking forward to listening to these. I'm sure they're pretty good. This box set was maybe $32, $35 after tax for four albums. That's not too bad. Oh, we're going to have to wait extra long because no one's uploaded this into Accurate Rip. So it has to rip twice. To verify the accuracy. Yeah, it tells me that it was produced by Alan Parsons on the back. Yep, three of them were produced by Alan Parsons and one by Roy Thomas Baker. Looks like David Patton and Billy Lyall did most of the songwriting. Ian Berenson has some songwriting on the second one. Looks like David Patton kind of took over the songwriting. Interesting. Yeah, you kind of go from... I assume what's on the album cover of the first album is Billy Lyall, David Patton, and Ian Berenson. Because apparently they didn't think the drummer was important enough. but, And then it goes to having... A full band picture on the rear of the the second album. And then when you get to the last album, it just looks like it's Ian Berenson and David Patton. I assume that's who it is because they're the only people that have songwriting credits on the album itself. So, like a lot of groups, they just kind of like fall apart after a while.
I really wish I could play clips from these albums on the stream, but then the I'd get demonetized. Not like I'm gonna make any money from these videos, but then I'd get marked as with copyright, you know. Then I can't monetize videos. You know what I think I'll do is I'll I might just play some music that I don't think anyone would mind being on here. Maybe I'll test the waters on another stream. I'm new to all this, so I'm not sure how all of the stuff works of copyright and how the videos get muted and how they get tagged for by YouTube's DMN say DMCA automatic algorithms. So we're on the second disc, second flight. I'm curious what the big hits they had are. <laughs> they don't even have Wikipedia pages for albums beyond the first one. Pilot the albums. Once again, we're tagging as pop rock. We're just calling it a compilation. I never check the compilation flag on here because it's just it's just unnecessary in my opinion. Just make it a regular release. You're my number one. I'm curious what their hits are. I tried looking that up. You alone. Also, another tag I never worry about is the composer. I just, I don't care. I care, but I don't care when it comes to tagging. Like, I don't care who the composer is when I'm searching for a song. I might listen to it, and then after the fact, I care about, you know, who wrote the song. But it's just like, I don't need to search through my tags for composers. I assume it's more for classical music anyway. Okay, Magic was a hit. January, that's another, another one of their songs, but I don't remember how it goes. David Patton and Ian Berenson also played on Kate Bush's second album, Lionheart. I forgot about that. Did forget about that. And you have Andrew Powell, who I believe he was a conductor that worked with Alan Parsons on a lot of his albums. Andrew Powell also worked a lot with Kate Bush. I 
I thought Pilot was somehow related to the Bay City Rollers, and it looks like Billy Lyall might have been a member of the Bay City Rollers. I don't know what songs the Bay City Rollers have, but... Let's look at their singles. Shang Lang, remember Sha La 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 La. Bye bye, baby. Give a little love. Those don't sound familiar. Money, honey. I think the Bay City Rollers are somehow involved with I think there was some controversy with them like someone in the band got arrested for child porn or something <laughs> I know that seems to be a recurring theme to a lot of these artists that they, like yesterday we're talking about Man of War and how the guitarist had been arrested for having possession of child pornography but I think the Bay City Rollers had something like that too Yep, yeah, there it is. Former Bay City Roller escapes jail on child porn charges. <laughs> the drummer. David Longmuir. I thought that was the case. I had heard something about that. Ooh, that album art's kind of cool. I don't know how well you can see that on the video, but like it's made up of faces. Like the pictures made up each one of these like little dots is like a face. That's cool. I'm curious if these albums have been reissued recently besides in this box set. Looks like they've been reissued in Europe in the 90s, and then in Japan recently, like within the last decade. That's the case for a lot of albums, is they get reissued in Japan, you know, constantly, and you don't hear anything about them in the United States or in Europe, like since the 90s. Morin Heights. From 1976. That must have been around the time that uh, Alan Parsons was working on Tales of Mystery and Imagination with Eric Wolfson. Yeah, the first albums are from 75. This one's from 76. No metadata again. Classify this pop rock. Put it under the compilation. Set the year as the release date of the compilation. Why is running? Trembling Maniac. Oops. Lady Luck. Us. Looks like this has two tracks. What must have been from singles. 
from both William Whitehall and David Patton. I like it when box sets include that kind of stuff. Like, you have so many instances. One instance is the Beach Boys, like with uh, Brian Wilson, where Caroline No was released under his name, but he was still in the Beach Boys. I don't remember what the B-side of Caroline No is. Stop and let go. No ties, no strings. Maniac. Us. Okay, that one. Go. Uh oh. We have a call. Hello? Hello. What's up? Just in the middle of recording this video. Yeah, what's this one about? I am continuing the ripping session that uh, was going on yesterday because I have so many CDs we couldn't fit into one video or even two videos. <laughs> wow. So is whatever I say right now going to be in the video? Yes, it is. Uh oh. <laughs> I better be a good boy, I suppose. I mean, you can cuss if you want, but I don't care. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, you right now. Yet. All right, sorry, go ahead. Right now, I am ripping. Of course, I could share my screen with you if you wanted to, so you could see what I'm doing. Sure. Okay. Right now I'm ripping a box set by the band called Pilot. And you would know them from their song called Magic. Like, whoa, it's magic. <laughs> I, I don't I don't remember how the rest of the song goes, but Yeah, that's all I know too. You're not talking about like, oh, oh, it's magic. Yep, that's it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I know that song. But it's like a four-disc box set that has all four of their 70s albums. And I've been curious to listen to them because they're related to another group that I like called the Alan Parsons Project. Which that band you would know from... Uh, the song Sirius S-I-R-I-U-S which is the it was the Chicago Bulls like opening song like dun 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 I don't know how to describe that one or sing that one either but yeah I don't know that one have you talked in your uh, videos your streams about um, your collection in its entirety or no, not really. I'm just, I just have a pile of CDs and I talk about them as I rip them so far. I haven't talked gotcha. about my collection in its entirety because it's ridiculously huge. Yeah, what's your estimate on how many you got? Well, how many, how many artists? All right, we'll start, we'll start small. How many artists you got? I can look that information up. Like, I can't tell you how many physical CDs I have. But I can tell you how many artists I have in my physical or my digital library, which includes the physical CDs. Now, are you ripping new CDs that you have or do you still have like, I don't know, like 100 plus that you still need to rip on there? Are you just going through all your physical copies? So I have two piles. <laughs> One is the pile that I hope to get through today, and these are recent albums that I've gotten. And I've put them in a pile specifically to be on the stream. And then I have the secondary pile of albums that have kind of fallen by the wayside, 
that I need to rip that I haven't for various reasons. Some of them require a lot of tagging work. So I have to like sit there and manually go through each track and make sure it has the right information for like seven discs, which that's going to take a while. Yeah. Others yeah, are like, there's an instance where I have a tame and policy D where I have a high resolution digital download of it already, which is theoretically higher than CD quality. But then I also have the CD. So that would make, I would have to re tag my existing files and then synchronize it across my library and then incorporate the CD version into it. So there's just a little bit more work that goes into some of these or some of them. I just, aren't as important like I bought what I bought Prince's 1999 2 CD set like I want to listen to it but it, I just put it in the pile and haven't gotten around to it and then I have two box sets that require a lot of work for the blu-ray on the Marillion set that I have um, it's called Script of a Gesture's Tear, I think. That has a Blu-ray which has about five or six different programs that I'd have to rip on top of having to decode the Blu-ray, like doing a backup to decode it so it's not like um, encrypted. And then I'd have to go through, get the surround sound. I'd have to get through and get all the programs on it and tag them from scratch. So when you're talking about decoding the Blu-ray, are you just copying the files to your computer and then what, like unzipping them or how does that work? It's basically what you describe. It's copying them to my hard drive and then organizing them by which title they belong to, which is, I refer to that as a program. For instance, with the Marillion set, I'm pretty sure there's a surround sound version of the album. There's a new stereo remix. There's the original stereo mix that's been remastered. Then there's a live concert, and then I have to dig through the titles and tag each of them using the information found in the booklet. If that makes any sense. So it's just a lot of legwork. Yes. I think I understand. Okay. So you're being you're being lazy and you just don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Playing exactly. too much destiny, right? What? Playing too much destiny, right? Yeah, I'm just I'm a destiny fiend. <laughs> <laughs> so you asked how many artists I have. I have 813. And that's just what you have ripped. Correct. So that doesn't include the X amount of CDs that are just sitting there waiting to be consumed by your PC. I think all the CDs that are waiting to be ripped Besides Pilot, which I'm ripping right now, I have the same artist in my library already. Gotcha. Now, oh Jesus. <laughs> you want to know how many albums I got? Yeah. I have 2,536 albums. Damn. <laughs> so you have, you have a minimum of 10,000 songs I have 35 I think I have 35,000 and 22 songs and it looks like that adds up to 16 weeks of music 16 weeks 2 days 14 hours 46 minutes and 25 seconds of music <laughs> See, that, that's not as bad as I thought. I thought it was gonna be a lot, a lot bigger. Because you could put it on shuffle, and then you could be done by, you know, before the month's out. 
Not 16 weeks. <laughs> oh, 16 weeks. I was thinking days for some reason. No. 16 weeks and two days. Okay. Yeah, that's quite a bit. That would take you a while to get through. <laughs> now, when you're... Because I don't really do this as much anymore since my iPod broke on me, but... When you listen to music, do you listen to the same few artists in a cycle? Or do you try to listen to everything? Or is it just what you're feeling? Um, I usually get stuck in a loop where I listen to stuff I bought recently. I don't dive deep into my catalog of music and just pick something usually. Usually it's like, well, I bought this, I should listen to this. And then it turns into listening to music by the same artist. Um, I have such a huge catalog that I, I've tried to find ways to get myself to listen to material in my backlog, in my catalog, I suppose is what you'd call it, but it just usually doesn't work out that way. I do have a music server that has a feature where it shuffles albums and I'll pull that up on my tablet, I'll cast it to my TV, or my uh, speaker system in my bedroom, and I'll just pull up a random album in my catalog, and I'll listen to it. But I don't do that very often. Yeah, when I listen to music, it's usually just, I don't know, <clears throat> the same stuff. The same, like, seven or eight artists. Maybe sometimes I'll throw in a rando. Like Chicago, Led Zeppelin, um, Greta Van Fleet. been listening to a lot of them. That's probably the newest band that I've attached myself to. Yeah, I've heard you talk about them pretty often. I listened to this, um, this band the other day on public radio. Uh, I got, hang on a second, it's on my phone. It's by, it's called Good Night Moon by Shivery. It's pretty cool. It was a good track. It was really, I don't know, kind of dark and mellow. How do you spell it? Shivery is S-H-I-V-A-R-E-E. Okay, I found them on Wikipedia. Their Shoot. first album is called I Ought to Give You a Shot in the Head for Making Me li Live in This Dump. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, this, the song that I listen to is kind of like if you were in a... I don't know, a speakeasy in a Tarantino movie. I could definitely see this song being played in the background. It did say that the band was featured in Kill Bill Volume 2. <laughs> was it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right on the money. Huh. That's a pretty cool coincidence. All right, what do I want to do? Do I want to grind some strikes out? I guess so. Why not? Why not, man? I mean, what else can we do? That's usually my go-to thing in Destiny is just doing strikes. And then I find myself two hours later wondering why I exist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is a variety of things to do. It's just, I don't know. I feel like even with the variety, it still feels repetitive and a lot of go fetch quests and grind fests. And... Yeah. I thought the original Destiny was amazing. 
one of the best games I ever played. <laughs> but I got into it. I got into it after or right at the end of the first year. Yeah. So it was a little more polished than launch and they had a little more content. And then when they threw year two in there with the Taken King, it was like, oh my God. They did yeah. a great job with that DLC. That DLC was worth every penny. I'm the opposite. I uh, I played a crap ton of Destiny when there was absolutely no content, and I just played it over and over and over and over again. <laughs> and then I was so sick of it, I just like got rid of the game. <laughs> Did you ever play Destiny One with us? I don't think so. Hmm. The first time I remember playing games with you was Diablo 3. And that would have oh, been me, like... Me, you, and Kelly? Yeah. That would have been like 2016, 17? Yeah. And that was, on, that was on PlayStation, right? Yep, PlayStation 4. All right, we got the pilot albums ripped. I hate to uh, repeat it, but there's a kind of nasty theme going on in these albums I've been ripping. There's a lot of musicians that have been charged with possession of child pornography <laughs> related what? to the music that I've been listening, I've been ripping. <laughs> what the heck, man? Like, uh, like I was telling Trenton yesterday, I was ripping a bunch of albums by the band Manowar, and their guitarist that had been with them since 1996, he got charged with the possession of child pornography like a couple years back, and then since then, <laughs> they stopped like re recording their albums, and so they just started doing remixes. Is that. So is Manowar like um, the inspiration for your handle? Yes, it is. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but in my defense, that guy wasn't involved on the album that inspired the Hanawar Hale title. Okay. He was associated where, with the band after you that. Say it, buddy. The guitarist on the album that has Hail and Kill, which inspired the Hail at the end of Hanawar was Ross the boss. He is not he is not known for having possession of child pornography. Do you think that's why is that the reason why he left the band? No. Hey, the guys the guys who was with were like, "No, nah, we don't want you here anymore. You fucking weirdo." No. Well, why did he leave then? Um, I don't remember. But Ross the boss left in like 90, 1990, and then they had another guitarist named David Shankel, and he's more of like a shredder type of guitarist, and he did an album with them. And then after that, the guy that is known for having the child pornography, his name is Carl Logan. He joined them in 1996 and is with them until 2018 when he got charged. Hmm. Yeah, kind of. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to say your name or think about your name without thinking about that guy now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. The kid diddler. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. Dude, these guys I'm playing to strike with are garbage. They don't know what they're doing. How do you not know what to do in a strike? <laughs> I don't know. And it's it's the war mine strike where you have to fight the uh, the giant worm. Yeah. 
don't know, maybe they're just lazy. Maybe I'm just trying to be lazy and they're not letting me because they're lazier than I am. Could be. All right. Speaking of child pornography, we have our next Man of War album that we're ripping. <laughs> 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 we have Into Glory Ride. It's the Imperial Edition. And 2019, it's a remix and remaster. Featuring Ross the Boss on guitar. Not the child pornographer. Not Chris Logan. <laughs> not Carl Logan. This does not feature Kyle the Logan. It does. It does not feature Carl Logan, the man that's known to possess Wait, child pornography. Kyle, Kyle, Carl, Carl, Carl Logan, that son of a bitch. That son of a bitch. I believe the tags are correct. So, like, the first Manowar album was, like, I think Judas Priest, but a little bit more of, like, a straightforward hard rock kind of sound. And then you have, this is their second album, Into Glory Ride. It's much more influenced by, like, doom metal, and it's a lot heavier. Especially with, like, Secret of Steel, Hatred, and what's the other song that's really heavy? I think Revelation Death's Angel is another really heavy song. I'm curious if it has lyrics on the booklet. Yep, it has the lyrics. Yeah, Man of War is like, imagine Judas Priest, but the lyrics are about metal itself, and they're all really cheesy. And then they take themselves very seriously while wearing, caught, like, leather caught, chains. Caught that tidbit from your last stream about how they take themselves too seriously. Yeah. What they are. I'd say their music is pretty good. It's not like... I don't think it reaches the highs of some other metal bands. But it's still like... It's solid rock and metal music. That was a quick rip. Now we're on to the main event. We have the Phil Collins Take a Look at Me Now box set. There you go. Oh my god, that guy killed us all. And this has eight albums in it. We got Face Value, Hello I Must Be Going, No Jacket Required, but seriously... Both sides, dance into the light, testify, and going back. And these are all from the recent remasters that they did. Which, from my impression, weren't amazing, but they were decent. And if this box set wasn't so cheap, I probably wouldn't have gotten it. Because I already have really good versions of uh, at least the first four albums. Got a little hype sticker that says limited edition eight CD set featuring the complete remastered studio albums. And then it's like a, a pretty cheap 
but reasonably priced clamshell box. And just has like these little cardboard sleeves with the uh, redone artwork, which I think was kind of a cool idea where he redid the artwork using his current face. Wait, Phil Collins has a face? He does. What a man. <laughs> I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? I think this box set was only like 27 bucks for 8 CDs. That's pretty good. Yeah, I think I'm going to do the same thing as I did with the pilot set where I'm going to uh, just tag it as a box set instead of doing the individual albums. Give me that loot. <coughs> you any good loot? No, I never do. Come on, man. Killed the big baddie, though. Doesn't include a booklet. I'm not real surprised by how cheap it was. Finest Matto Weave. Give me your finest Matto Weave. I really like the uh, the original Into Glory ride artwork by Man of War. It's very cheesy. It's like them wearing like fur and leather, and <laughs> it looks so stupid. It should be quick riffs because they're already in the database.
Right now we're ripping Hello I Must Be Going, which I think has some of his best solo tracks. Through These Walls is probably my favorite Phil Collins song. It's kind of kind of creepy though. And you have Like China, which <laughs> it's kind of funny in modern context. I don't care anymore, probably being the biggest hit off the song, off the uh, album. And uh, the next one is probably the first Phil Collins album I ever listened to, besides what I heard on the radio, which is No Jacket Required. My parents had it on cassette tape, and I remember, for some reason, I particularly remember Take Me Home. I don't know, just because it's like the end of the album. I think I remember that one the most. Obviously, Sue Studio is just like kind of an overplayed track. Kind of tired of hearing that one, honestly. How does that go? Um, crap. How does that go? <laughs> What's the... I feel bad that I can't remember how it goes. Um. 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 Oh, it goes. It starts with like a little drum machine kind of thing. Boom. Chow. Boom, boom, chow, and then it goes bum 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 <laughs> su, 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 <studio. laughs> something like that I don't know if I've ever heard that song <laughs> you should look it up I guarantee you've heard it before and if you haven't I'll be very surprised <laughs> oh my goodness. The Minotaur killed me. Uh oh. Disc three eight. How come your face isn't in this one? On what you see? How come your face isn't in this one? through discord on the screen share i can't see your face at all yeah because i uh i can share my webcam through discord but it won't display on the screen hmm. but in the video i have it like in the bottom left corner i gotcha so it'll show up in the video just not on what you're seeing Do you think your voice sounds weird listen back, listening back to it? Yeah. I've always thought it sounded weird whenever I recorded it and played it back. Like it, I think it's because you're like, your voice resonates in your head and it sounds like deeper and more like powerful <laughs> to yourself <laughs> than it does yep. to other people. Yeah, I know. Robert, Robert thinks he sounds like a, a wimp. <laughs> I think Robert just sounds like Robert, but I think you're right about the whole resonating in your uh <clears throat> in your head differently. Yep. I remember the first time I heard my voice recorded back, my uh 
my grandfather on my mom's side had like a camcorder and he just like recorded us like goofing around at like a birthday party or something and i was saying something and i remember i remember my reaction when i heard it I was like that doesn't sound like me <laughs> and then everyone made fun of me <laughs> Yeah, that's weird. Oh, the lasers got me. Oh, I know which one you're doing. Is it the one inside the Pyramidian or whatever it's called? Yep. With Valus Thune. The artistry. Just lasers, man. I was Seriously? Oh, can't make this jump. No. <laughs> <laughs> Steve sent me a snap, and it's something called Tushy, St and it says, stop wiping your butt, start washing with Tushy. <laughs> Bum wash, aka booty cleaner. <laughs> oh Gotta my clean God. that booty. <laughs> That's the content that people want. Oh, I just jumped right into lasers. Ooh. Did you know you can get a sign up for informed delivery from the postal service and you can see all your mail that's coming to you? I did not know that. I'm looking at mine right now and I got a letter from Tammy Duckworth. Oh, Tammy. I remember sending her something about something before. Rations gathered. Why am I gathering rations? Let's see. Correct all the tags on this one. But seriously, it was probably the first Phil Collins album I listened to a ton of and just absolutely loved. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan, but I like his music. Some of his music really is just overplayed, you know? But I got to a point within the air tonight where I could listen to it again. But... It seems like it used to be on the radio, like every other song. Yeah. You're talking about that song that goes, I can feel it in the air tonight. The stars are bright. Fernando. No. <laughs> no that's not, that's not, not that cool. one. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh, oh see, Lord. Oh, Lord. 
this whole time. I thought that was ABBA. Dun, 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 <laughs> oh god. I'm a big fan of bands or artists that have like really melancholy music cuz <laughs> I like to uh what's the word? I like to subject myself to the melancholy music cuz then it makes me feel melancholy. So it's kind of like a never ending it's like a harmful cycle. And that's kind of how but seriously is for me. It's like especially with uh another day in paradise. That's definitely like kind of a downer type of song about like homeless people. Hmm. Yeah, music will definitely make me feel a certain type of way too. When you get get into a song. Yeah. That's how I know if I if I think the music is good or not though, is if I feel something from it. Or am I get I'm getting something out of it. Even if it is melancholy. Yeah, I would say it's the same for me. It's like if the music makes me feel something or if I can like identify with or connect with the music, it's it's definitely music that I consider to be like good or I want to re engage with. Yep. I was talking with Trenton about how I didn't like rap music the other day and I've thought about it a lot before and it's like I just don't think I identify with that kind of music or like the lyrical content you know yeah I'm not really a fan either but there are some albums that I like just because of the way um, the songs are written or the uh, I don't know what you call it but like the song that's in the background or the theme of the song, I don't know. The melody? Is that what you're talking about? Like a <clears throat> No, know. like a lot of a lot of uh rap artists will take like the chorus from other songs or the beat from other songs and they'll use them. Yeah, they'll sample them. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to take a short bathroom break. It's your job to carry on with the video, Tom. What? <laughs> what do I have to talk about? I don't know anything about Pilot. <laughs> what about Phil Collins? I, like I said, I'm not a big fan, but I do like his music. To help you out, I'll yeah. play my music go in the ahead. background. You go ahead and I'll tell a story. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll be back in a minute. All right, man.
tell your story, Tom? I didn't. I lied. Oh, well. Were you hoping to come back to me relating some tale of Daring Do? Yes, I was. This six of this eight CD box set. the Phil Collins albums I've barely listened to like Dancing to the Light Testify and Going Back Testify to the Light. I always remember thinking that Testify didn't sound very good because of the sound quality it's very hotly mastered And then the version of going back in this box set, it's different than the version that was released years ago. It's called The Essential Going Back. So I think he basically took that album and then edited it down. I think he just removed some songs he didn't like or something. I'm curious to compare these to the other versions that I have. to the point where I'm gonna have to buy a bigger hard drive to store all my music. I have a three terabyte drive. Dang. Dang, son. So I'm not looking forward to having to transfer everything. Then I'm not sure how reliable like high capacity drives are. Like I bought an eight terabyte drive, like how reliable are those? The platters on those have to be huge. There has to be a lot of moving parts. Makes me think of the, uh... Oh, I gotta sneeze. Ooh! Makes me think of the Rage Against the Machine song, Testify. Or am I thinking of Killing in the Name of... <laughs> Rage Against the Machine, Testify. That's the song, right? Yeah. Alright, man. 
I'm gonna make some food. But I should be back. Okay. Um. Ah, ah. Yeah. You enjoy the rest of your the rest of your video. Yep, I'll be done with it soon once I get done ripping this box up. And then I'll probably get that on uh, Destiny later. Cool, man. Well, I'll talk to you later then. See you, Tom. Well, we did end up having a guest. Cool. I wasn't expecting anyone to join. Um, let's see. Yeah, we're just about done ripping this box set. Then I'll probably end the video. It's not too late. You can look at me now. One thing I'm kind of disappointed with by this box set is that it doesn't have like some of the non non album tracks, like uh, a groovy kind of love, um, easy lover. God, I'm trying to remember the other Phil Collins songs. What's the one? There are a few other soundtracks that have uh, songs from Phil Collins. I can't remember. But I wish there was a disc like that that had those songs in this box set. But it does seem to be more of a, a kind of a cheaper, budget-minded way to get the studio albums. I was saying before, Testify is one of those albums I really haven't listened to that much. It's kind of a... I think it was just mastered too loudly for me and the songs just weren't hidden right for me when I was listening to it before. So I'm curious to see how this remastering is. I don't think I've ever listened to Going Back by Phil Collins. That's one I haven't listened to. like a couple of these albums have bonus tracks like the times they are changing and I'm pretty sure that's a Bob Dylan song and I don't think that was on the original Dance in the Light album right there. same thing with uh, We Said Hello Goodbye like I don't remember that song being on No Jacket Required I thought Take Me Home was the last track of that album Is going back. Got Phil with his snare drum and his sticks. It's got 14 songs, so I'm not sure what they would have cut. That seems like a pretty meaty set of songs, 14. It's 45 minutes. That's pretty good. I mean, anything less than 40 minutes or 38 minutes, I would say, is probably like approaching EP territory. So, the essential going back.
I got Phil staring at me. show how I uh, do the album art on these it's pretty simple it doesn't take a lot of a lot of time to do but it is if you're doing a lot of albums at once it is time consuming essentially what I do is I gather the album art from one of two sources I get it either from the site album art exchange Dot com or you just do a simple Google search and you try to find the highest resolution and highest quality album art that you can um, and then I take it and I downscale it to a thousand by a thousand pixels so it's, I try to get them to be square and uh, I use a program called paint.net to resize and save them and I try to make sure the file size is always less than 400 kilobytes just so it doesn't take so long and really that's really you don't need extremely high quality like lossless PNG files I mean a 400 kilobyte JPEG file is gonna look very good anyway so I do it to save space too because album art adds up because it gets I tag them onto the files themselves. I don't do anything like putting an album art picture in a folder and then that's the designated album art for the, the album. Excuse me. I track, I tag every single file with its own album art. That way, no matter what, you have the album art, you know what it looks like, you can extract it, you can change it, you can do whatever you want to. We've got all those ripped. like the way that looks. Take a look at me now. Okay, we're done with DB Power Amp. And we did have a few uh, albums that weren't in the accurate database, so we'll submit those. Got those submitted. Firefox and then we'll bring over Fubar which is where I do my tagging actually we do need Firefox to get the album art so. I'm just going to show you one example and then I'll probably end the stream here. So we need the full size cover. I save it in my music directory. Then I pull up in the program paint.net. It's like paint, but it has more features to it. It's basically kind of a midway point between paint and Photoshop. Pull it over. 
delete button from my directory, drag it over, and open it. Resize it to 1000 by 1000, it was 1500 by 1500. And then I want to make sure the file size is less than 400 kilobytes, which it is. There we go, we got it saved. We'll pull, pull over FUBAR here. We'll remove the album art that was put in place from DB Power Amp. DB Power Amp does get album art automatically. And you can get different album art if you choose to do so within the program. But I find that just getting your own album art from Album Art Exchange or just Googling it is, it'll give you better results. But it takes more work for sure. Then we'll highlight the album, go to tagging, attach pictures, then we'll go to the folder where we have that picture that we saved and modified, and then it'll attach it. And we'll see it here at the bottom left corner, which there you can see it now. <laughs> it's that easy. But when you're doing that, it does take up a lot of time, especially if you're tagging a lot of albums at once. Alright, I think we'll end the video here. Um, if you got this far and you watched the whole thing, I commend you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, if you have any ideas for me, Feel free to send them to me in a message, leave them as a comment. Um, some of you have me on Discord. Uh, just let me know what you think, what you want to see. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. You have a good day.